size. One day I had to detail a rescue one. One of the firefighters getting off that morning was their senior man. He quickly showed me around the rig and helped me get squared away. We went to several fires, and in the early afternoon, he returned to work the night tour again, offering me the opportunity to take off early. I informed him that I was also working, that he should relieve someone else. So I stuck around, and I watched as he cleaned the tools and generally worked on getting things squared away. This man had 30 years on a job, a career's worth in the rescue alone. I watched as he did things many senior firefighters delegate to those who were junior. He didn't do that. Why? Because he enjoyed it, and he was a true senior man. He led by example. Cleaning tools is not some lowly act to be done by the junior firefighter. Like firefighting, it is a group effort. He was as tough as nails. He enjoyed getting dirty, and nothing made him happier than going to fires. His name was Joe Angelini. He epitomized what a firefighter should be. I ran into him and three friends I used to work with three weeks prior to 9-11. He was the senior firefighter for FDNY at the time. All four of those gentlemen were killed on 9-11. I was indeed fortunate to work where I worked as a firefighter. It helped me bring, it brought me here today. The first article I wrote for the magazine was extremely long and covered a bunch of subtopics until I showed it to a deputy chief who worked in my firehouse, you may have heard of, Vincent Dunn. He read it and pointed out the short article contained inside that manifesto. It became the first ever truck company column for Fire Engineering Magazine. Another man you may have heard of kept his car in our firehouse, Father Michael Judge, FDNY chaplain, whose church was across the street. Spent many hours with him. His special insight and manner always made you feel at peace. The night before I got promoted, the lieutenant asked me if I wanted to take his seat instead. I declined and explained to Lieutenant Bill McGinn that I would be doing that for the rest of my career and I would prefer to have the irons. We had a fire, I forced two doors. So that was, made me happy. Watching an unusually friendly new firefighter in Rescue One did not prepare me for our meeting on a rooftop on Broadway, where Kevin Shea trusted me to lower him 13 floors above the street to rescue a trapped civilian. My time in the truck was great. I was promoted to lieutenant and assigned to Battalion 16 in Harlem, where I currently assigned. While working in the neighborhood engine as a covering officer, a captain presented me with an offer I couldn't refuse. Did I want to come to 69 Engine? When the most famous member of FDNY asks you to come on board the best engine in the city, you hope you can live up to Patty Brown's expectations. I spent over 10 years in 69, where I was told I made a good transition between trucking and firefighter. <laughs> I'm currently assigned to Ladder 28, you can't ask for a better place to work. We talk about training. Let me tell you, you know where you want to get to in training? Where your people are self-motivated and start their own training. That's the place that is. A Harlem Hilton, number one in customer and firefighter satisfaction. There's nothing wrong with today's firefighters. I hear a lot about these college kids entering the fire service. But believe it or not, we had college kids joining the fire service back in the 80s. I know. I was one of them. It's not a new thing. Yes, it can seem overwhelming sometimes that all our firefighters now have a degree instead of a trade, but it's up to you to make sure you develop a trade in them, the trade of firefighter. There is, however, something wrong with some of today's leadership and the message they are spreading. The path they have chosen to follow is paved with yellow safety bricks. If you follow this road, it could cause the fire service to suffer its greatest collective loss, the loss of public trust. Think about it for a second. All the goodwill we have accumulated, the faith, the support, gone. Why? Because we have changed the pecking order. The firefighter is now number one, and the public is number two. I always thought that the customer was number one. I believe that the constant barrage of safety messages is undermining our sworn duty. A fire department that writes off civilians faster than an express line of six reasons or less is not progressive. It's dangerous because it's run by fear. Fear does not save lives, it endangers it. We built safety into all our operational tasks. Our SCBA is pre-tested to work, hose lines charged before entry. But your personal safety should not be about fear. Fear is the firefighter's enemy. 
Should you be cautious and knowledgeable? Yes. Should you be fearful? No. Our leaders need poise, not fear. Too much safety makes Johnny a poor leader and a terrible rescuer. Let's get straight. Let's get this part straight. I don't wish to see anyone seriously injured or killed. However, we've started to turn a corner in the fire service, and the street it leads us to may have a worse ending than what we're trying to avoid. If you preface everything with, you the firefighter are the most important person on the scene, or you are number one, hold on. I love my brother the firefighter too, but what about the civilians we swore to protect? When you think you are number one, because all you have ever heard is you're number one, you will start to believe it. This order, this pecking order, is the problem. Why risk yourself for those less important? The steady drip of safety message is really necessary? Many would argue, yes, it is, that if we don't constantly remind you of how dangerous the job can be, you'll get hurt. If you read the safety message warning inside your helmet, it plainly states that firefighting is an inherently dangerous job. It's dirty, difficult, demanding, and dangerous, just the way it will always be no matter how much we try to make it safer. Attempting to make your job safer by teaching you to place yourself above those in need is wrong and goes against everything the fire service has ever stood for. We have the highest approval rating and respect of any profession. Why is that? Because we do what has to be done. We are noble. We are self-sacrificing. We are willing to risk our lives to save a total stranger. When we modify or tweak that thinking along the lines of saving lives, we not only risk a fall from public grace, we risk something much more harmful, the loss of our identity. There are many tasks you perform every day that are not fire-related, but only firefighters put out fires. When that parent meets you outside their house and tells you their child is inside, trapped, you are their last hope. What are you going to do? You must find a way in to save that life if humanly possible. What are your chances? Your chances are always the same. They're 50-50. Either you do it or you don't. You must call upon what's inside you, your courage, your determination, your will. You must shed your personal cocoon of safety and take a risk. If it was easy, someone else would have done it already. What's going to be more difficult for you? Figuring the quickest way in and the quickest way out? Or you're in a conflict because you don't do high-risk profile. Let's not let them down. They're all we have. Here are the cliff notes. We need leaders at the command level and company level who value courage, determination, and pride. We need leaders who inspire our people. We need leaders who understand that what we do makes a difference. It makes a difference that we turn out quickly. It makes a difference that we stretch correctly. It makes a difference that we do a search. It makes a difference that we have leaders who believe in the core values of courage, determination, and pride. What do I know? I'm just an urban firefighter. I know all about heroes. I know all about sacrifice. I know all about courage. I see it in all of you. I worked at Ground Zero on a one-month detail back in January 2002. There were no survivors. The only thing we could bring out of there was dignity to the people we found. And we found several. We found firefighters. One day a firefighter was found and identified. That firefighter was the son of an active battalion chief. I watched as his body was carried up a muddy hill to a waiting ambulance. The details stood at attention along the side of the roadway. There was silence as the battalion chief, along with firefighters from his son's company, helped carry his son out of the pit. I thought to myself, where do you get the strength? Where do you get the strength while your heart is ripped apart? Where do, you get to see, where do you get the strength to see all your dreams and hopes for someone you love vanish? I don't know where you get that strength. But I do know the events of that day showed the world that we are very special people, that we are willing to risk our lives for others, to do what needs to be done, and that we care deeply. That month was the most physically and emotionally draining month I ever worked in my life. It was also the most rewarding. We do not need a culture of safety. We need a culture of extinguishment. We have firefighters killed on a nozzle. We 
We have firefighters getting killed on a nozzle. And while these programs are nice, a lot of our energies are focused on RIT and saving our own. We have to remember about the civilians who don't have the luxury of masks and everything else. If we put out the fire, safety is accomplished for everyone on the fire ground. There are state fire conferences where there are no engine classes given. That's a disgrace. We need to get the first line right. We need to commit staffing to that line. We need to push in and put the fire out. The, only, the engine only gets one shot at success. Let's give it to them and increase everyone's safety. We have instructors who've never worked on fire trucks telling our people how to do things. Show me the credibility in that. You may be a certified instructor with a year in the fire service, but besides reading slides, what else do you bring to the table? I know what your resume says, but what's missing from it is probably much more telling. Some have told you that if you never went to another fire, you would be a successful organization, and that by having fires, we have failed. I'm here to tell you that you have not failed, because there is a fire in your area. We will fail if we do not exercise and practice our craft. It's a privilege to be in the fire service. It's a privilege to work with people who care about other people. It's a privilege to be accepted in the family of firefighters. Today is about finding your personal spark. If you're lucky, you find it right away. The fire service holds out one for each of us. Once you find it, keep it. Once you find it, share it. Once you find it, realize how truly fortunate you are. Learn all you can about the enemy. Train. Try new methods. Be careful out there. And remember to keep fire in your life. Thank you for attending. Have a great conference. I'm here all week. Look at you.